to this show. We're very, very gratified. Thank you all for coming. Uh, this is a bit of an experiment for us. Um, the Vancouver International Writers Festival is very pleased, along with the Alma Street Cafe, to welcome you this evening. Um, on behalf of my partner, June Katz, and myself, and the rest of the staff here, we wish you uh, a very pleasant evening. The show is a little difficult, perhaps at times, but I think you'll find it most rewarding. Thank you again. once a week and win if possible. Learning to win is hard. Any slob can be a good loser. And don't forget your Brahms, your Bach, and your beer. Don't overexercise. Sleep until noon. Avoid credit cards or paying for anything on time. And remember, there isn't a piece of ass in this whole world worth over 50 bucks. That was in 1977. And if you have the ability to love, love yourself first. But always be aware of the possibility of total defeat. An early taste of death is not necessarily a bad thing. Stay out of churches. Stay out of bars and museums. And like the spider, be patient. Time. Time is everybody's cross. Just stay with the beer. Drink more and more beer. Beer is continuous blood a continuous lover. Just get yourself a large typewriter and as the footsteps go up and down outside your window you hit that thing, hit it hard. Make it a heavyweight fight. Make it the bull when he first charges in. And remember the old dogs who fought so well before you. Hemingway, Celine, Dostoevsky, Newt Hamsun, 
If you think they didn't go crazy in tiny rooms just like you're doing now, without women, without food, without hope, then you're not ready. Just drink more beer, more and more beer. There's always time. <laughs> there's always lots of time. But if there's not, well, that's all right, too. Just drink more beer, more and more beer. Ladies and gentlemen, I am not Charles Bukowski. I am not Mickey Rourke. <laughs> I'm not Faye Dunaway. My name is Henry, Henry Chinesky, poet at large. I'm a salesman. I sell poems. I am the American matador. I live in Hollywood on Sunset Boulevard with my girlfriend, Marilyn Monroe. I sell poems because I could never sell anything else. I never made it as an Amway man. I never made it selling the Encyclopedia Britannica. I never made it as your friendly Fuller Brush man. So I sell poems. I'm what you might call your friendly Fuller Poetry man. This is my destiny. My destiny is to sell fucking poems. For my blood money, money for my food, money for my rent, money for my booze. I sell poems. I recite poems I have long since become tired of. And I used to think at one time in my life that men who drove buses or cleaned out the toilets, the latrines, or murdered men in alleys were fools. But me, <laughs> I sell poems. Poems, poems, poems. They surround me. They haunt me each moment of my life. Sometimes I feel like I'm in a Western movie, having a gunfight at the OK Corral with my poems, pretending that I'm Clint Eastwood, Humphrey Bogart, or John Wayne. Poems. Poems like gunslingers sit around and they shoot holes in my window. They chew on my toilet paper. They read my race results. Poems like gunslingers sit around and they ask me what the hell my game is and would I like to shoot it out? <laughs> Take it easy, I say, just take it easy. The race is not to the swift. The poem sitting at the south end of my couch, he draws and he says, balls up for that one, mister. <laughs> take it easy, partner, I tell him, just take it easy. I got plans for you. Plans? What plans, mister? The New Yorker, partner, the New Yorker, and he puts his iron away. The poem sitting at the chair near my door, he stretches and he looks at me. You know, fat boy, he says, you've been pretty lazy lately. Fuck off, I say, just fuck off. Who's running this game anyway? We are running this game, say all the gun-slinging poems. So get with it, boy! Well, there you are, folks. This was the poem who was sitting on top of my refrigerator tonight, flipping beer caps. And now I've got him out of the way. And all the others are sitting around pointing their weapons at me, saying, I'm next, I'm next, I'm next. I suppose that when I die, the leftovers will jump some other poor son of a bitch. 
Holmes. I sell Holmes because I consider myself the world's biggest failure when it comes to the nine to five job. I've had many nine to five jobs in my life. I probably will still have to have some more nine to five jobs before it's all over. One of my most recent nine to five jobs I found through the newspaper, I was hired by a clothing store. I was hired as the extra ball bearing man. Now, the extra ball bearing man is the man who is simply turned loose without any specific duties. He's supposed to know what to do after consulting a deep well of ancient instinct. Instinctively, one is supposed to know how to best keep things running smoothly, best maintain the company, the mother, meet all her little needs, which are always irrational, continual, and petty. A good ball-bearing man is faceless, sexless, sacrificial. He's always waiting at the door when the first man with the key arrives. Soon he's hosing down the sidewalk, and he greets each person by name as they arrive in the morning with a bright smile and a reassuring manner. Now that makes everybody feel just a little bit better before the bloody grind of work begins. He sees that toilet paper is plentiful, especially in the ladies' crapper. That waste baskets never overflow. That small repairs are promptly made on desks and office chairs. That doors open easily. That clocks are set. That carpeting remains tacked down. And that overfed, powerful women do not have to carry small packages. <laughs> I wasn't very good. My idea was just to wander around doing nothing. <laughs> Always avoiding the boss and avoiding the stoolies who might report to the boss. I really wasn't all that clever. It was more instinct than anything else. You see, I always started a job with the feeling that I'd soon quit or be fired. And that gave me a kind of a relaxed manner, which was often mistaken for intelligence or some kind of a secret power. I'm really not a clothes man myself. I mean, clothes bore me. They're terrible things, cons like vitamins, astrology, pizzas, skating rings, pop music, heavyweight championship fights, etc. I arrived for work about two days late one morning. <laughs> Mr. Silverstein, the manager, was standing at the counter near the door. He had a check in his hand. He moved his hand slowly toward me. I moved up, picked up the check, walked back out on the street. <laughs> it was over. That's right. Jack, 
Uh, Jack, now will you listen to me? I don't want to repeat myself. I told you I'm busy tonight. I can't come and play. I'm at my piano. This is my piano. Other times, other times I get as good and as lucky as Chopin. Sometimes I get out of practice, out of tune. But that's all right. I can sit and I can vomit on the keys. But it's my vomit. <laughs> It's better than sitting in a room with three or four other people and their pianos. This is my piano, and it is better than theirs. And they like it, and they do not like it. speakers of Salinas. You know, I think of the men and women I have known working in factories all their lives, choking while living, choking while laughing at Bob Hope or Lucille Ball, while two or three of their children are beating tennis balls against the wall. Some suicides are just never recorded. I've had lunch out, I've mailed three letters, I've been to the grocery store, there's nothing on my TV, the telephone is quiet, I've even run dental floss between my teeth, it won't even rain, oh God, it won't even rain, I sit in my room night after night, drinking German beer, watching the early arrivals as they return from their eight-hour day jobs and park their beautiful cars behind the apartment next door. I sit drinking German beer, trying to come up with the big one. <laughs> But I'm not gonna make it. I'm not gonna make it. I'm just gonna keep drinking more and more German beer. Rolling my smokes. 
By 11 p.m. I'm gonna be spread out on my handmade bed, my face up asleep under the electric light. Still waiting, oh God, still waiting on the immortal poem. listening to Bruckner on the radio. I begin wondering why I'm not half mad over the latest breakup with my latest girlfriend. I begin wondering why I'm not driving the streets drunk. I begin wondering why I'm not in my bedroom in the dark, in the grievous dark, pondering, ripped by half-thoughts. I suppose that at last, like the average man, I have known too many women, and instead of thinking I wonder who's fucking her now, I think she's probably giving some other poor son of a bitch much trouble right now. Listening to Bruckner on the radio seems so peaceful. Too many women have gone through, but I'm at last alone without being alone. I sometimes pick up a Grumbucker paintbrush and I clean my fingernails with the hard, sharp end. I sometimes notice a wall socket. <laughs> hey, look. I've won. <laughs> I have won. On my way over here tonight, I was cornered by an English professor at some local university. He wanted to ask me a question. Now, Mr. Chinaski said, if you were teaching our students creative writing, what would you tell them? I laughed. I'd tell them to have an unhappy love affair hemorrhoids, bad teeth, and to drink cheap wine. I tell them to avoid opera, golf, and chess, and to keep switching the head of their bed from wall to wall. And then I tell them to have another unhappy love affair and never ever to use a silk typewriter ribbon. Avoid family picnics or being photographed in a rose garden. Read Hemingway only once. Skip Faulkner. <laughs> Ignore Gogol. Instead, stare at photos of Gertrude Stein and read Sherwood Anderson in bed while eating Ritz crackers and realize that People who keep talking about sexual liberation are more frightened than you are. Listen to E. Power Biggs work the organ on your radio while rolling Bull Durham tobacco in a dark room in a strange town with one they left on the rent after having given up friends, relatives, and jobs. Never consider yourself superior and or fair and never try to be. Have another unhappy love affair. Watch a fly on a summer curtain. Never try to succeed. Don't shoot pool. Be righteously angry when you find that your car has a flat tire. Take vitamins 
but don't lift weights or jog. <laughs> and after all this, reverse the procedure. <laughs> Have a good love affair. And the thing you might learn is this, that nobody, nobody knows anything. Not the state, the mice, your garden hose, or even the North Star. And if you people out there tonight ever catch me teaching a creative writing class, and you read this back to me, I'll give you a straight A right up the pickle barrel. <laughs> it's so nice to be able to say pickle barrel in North America. In Munich, I had to paraphrase, and even then, I did not succeed. It was difficult to explain to German people that pickle barrel had nothing to do with little cucumbers soaked in salt and vinegar. The trouble with writing is that everybody is a writer. Not everybody thinks they could be a dentist or an automobile mechanic. <laughs> but most of my friends think they could be great writers. Now fortunately, most men aren't writers or even cab drivers. And some men, many men, unfortunately aren't anything at all. My comrades, the other writers and the other poets, are numerous. Uh, this one is a, a friend of mine, a poet, and he'd been drinking for about two or three days, and he walked out on that stage just like I did tonight, and he looked at his audience, and he just knew. I mean, he really knew that he was going to do it. There was a grand piano on the stage, and he walked over to that grand piano, and he lifted the lid, and he vomited inside the piano. <laughs> and then he closed the lid, and he gave his reading. They had to remove the strings from the piano, and wash out the insides, and then restring it again. Now, I can really understand why they never invited him back. <laughs> but to pass the word on to other universities that he was a poet who liked to vomit into grand pianos was unfair. <laughs> they never considered the quality of his reading. I know this poet. He's just like the rest of us. He'll vomit anywhere for money. <laughs> Trying to be a poet and living at home with my parents wasn't very easy. <laughs> so I started making practice runs down to Skid Row very early in life, making ready for my future. <laughs> I found myself a rooming house and I paid a week's rent in advance. The nearest bar was 50 years old. The Gangplank Cafe. beer and offer me a cigarette. 
the gangplank cafe. You could smell the odor of urine, shit, and vomit of half a century as it come up through the floor and into the bar from the restrooms below. Every seat was usually taken. There were women in there, a few housewives and some ladies who'd fallen on hard times. One of those ladies got up one night and she walked off with a guy. She was back in five minutes. I figured she must have had a suction cup for a pussy or something. I gotta try me some of that, said an old guy sitting at the edge of the bar one night. I haven't had me a hard on since Teddy Roosevelt took his last hill. It took Helen ten minutes with that boy. The Gangplank Cafe. I come there and sit down with the boys. We talk about our broken lives, our broken brains, our broken bodies, and our broken hearts. Talk about broken hearts. I got a letter from my girlfriend the other day. I want to read it to you. Dear Henry, I care for you, darling. I love you. The only reason I fucked L is because you fucked Z. And then I fucked R and you fucked N. And because you fucked N, I had to fuck Y. But I think of you constantly, Henry. I feel you here in my belly like a baby. Love, I call it love. No matter what happens, I call it love. And so you fucked C. And then before I could move, you fucked W. So then I had to fuck D. But I want you to know that I love you, Henry. I think of you constantly. I don't think I've ever loved anybody like I love you. Your girlfriend, Jan. Woof. 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 Hmm. I don't know why I think of Doris Day when I read this letter. <laughs> Just what I was there for. 
You heard me say in a prayer For someone I really could care for And then you suddenly appeared Before me the only one in my arms Could ever hold I heard somebody whisper Please adore me And when I looked The moon had turned to gold blue Without a love of my own Plans for me My father worked as a guard For the Los Angeles County Museum He'd come home drunk every night after work And scream at me I risk my life he'd say, busting my ass to keep people from stealing. Now why the hell should you be sitting on your ass moping, Henry? I want you to be an engineer, you understand? I want you to be an engineer. Now how the hell are you gonna become an engineer when I come home every night and find your notebooks full of drawings of women with their skirts pulled up to their ass? Is this all you can draw, Henry? Why don't you draw flowers, or mountains, or the ocean? At least get yourself an honest job. Well, I got me an honest job to please the old man. The hours at the dog biscuit factory were from 4.30 p.m. to 1 a.m. I was given a dirty white apron and heavy canvas gloves. Now, the gloves were burned, and they had holes in them. I could see my fingers peeking through. I was given instructions by a toothless elf with a film over his right eye. It was white and green with spidery blue lines. He'd been on the job for 19 years. 19 years making dog biscuits. I'm telling you, those dog biscuit screens were heavy. Lifting one screen could tire a man. There were green biscuits, yellow biscuits, purple biscuits, brown biscuits, vitamin biscuits, vegetable biscuits. On such jobs, men become so very tired. They experience a weariness beyond fatigue. They begin to say mad, brilliant things. I really don't know how long I worked there. I just came in drunk every night. It really didn't matter. You see, I had the job that nobody wanted. One day I was on the job for about an hour. I got sober by accident. I quit. <laughs> Hello. Yeah, this is Chineski. Oh, hello, Mr. Editor. Oh, thank you, Mr. Editor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Your poems about the girls will still be around 50 years from now when the girls are gone. My editor phones me and he tells me that. Dear Mr. Editor, the girls appear to be gone already. <laughs> I know what you mean. But give me one truly alive woman walking across the floor toward me tonight, 
and you can have all my poems. All the good ones, all the bad ones, or any that I might write after this one. Yes, Mr. Editor, I know what you mean. Do you know what I mean? My editor, hmm, he loves my poems about the girls. A warped mind. He doesn't like anything else. Me. <laughs> I'm always searching for inspiration to write my immortal poem. And sometimes I just get into my car. And I drive down Hollywood Boulevard. And I notice schoolgirls. Oh my God. Schoolgirls in pantyhose. Sitting on bus stop benches. Looking tired at 13 with their raspberry lipstick. It's hot in the sun. The day at school has been dull and going home is dull. And I just drive around in my car peeking at their warm legs. Their eyes look away. They've been warned about ruthless and horny old studs. They're just not gonna give it away like that. Yet it's dull, it's so dull, waiting out the minutes on the bench and the years at home. The books they carry are dull, the food they eat is dull, and even the ruthless and horny old studs are dull. The girls in pantyhose wait. They await the proper time and moment. And then they will move, and then they will conquer. I just drive around in my car, peeking at their legs. Please, O oh God, so pleased that I shall never be part of their heaven or their hell. But that scarlet lipstick on those sad waiting mouths, it would be so nice to kiss each one of them once fully. And then I'd give them back. Oh, I promise to give them back. But the bus will get them first. The bus always gets them first. This one for my editor. Talking about schoolgirls, I remember my school days. About the eighth grade, going into ninth, I broke out with acne. Now, most of the guys in my school had it, but not like mine. I mean, mine was really terrible. <laughs> I was the worst case in town. I had pimples, boils, and scars all over my face, back, neck, and chest. I'd always had trouble with the girls, but with acne, <laughs> it was impossible. The girls were further away than ever. I read every issue of the Ladies' Home Journal, hoping that maybe I'd learn something about women. I stood in front of the mirror alone, and I looked at myself. I was horrified. No wonder, no wonder people stared at me and said very unkind things. I felt kind of singled out as if I'd been selected to be this way. I'd go to the beach with my friend Jim and he'd be off with five girls. And I'd be laying on the sand 
thinking of thousands of fish out there in the ocean eating each other. Endless mouths and assholes swallowing and shitting. The whole earth was nothing more than that to me. Jim would be standing up, sticking out his chest and showing off his balls. He didn't have my barrel chest and my big legs. He was tall, slender and neat with that slick black hair, little nasty mouth and perfect teeth, little round ears and perfect neck. Well, I didn't have a neck. I still don't have a neck. Not much of one anyway. My head seems to just sit on my shoulders. If it weren't for my boils and scars, though, I'd be flashing my balls, too. Yes, me with my 50 cents a week allowance from my daddy. But finally, thank God, Finally, it was my graduation day, the day of my senior prom. My senior prom. It was held in the girls' gym with live music. I stood outside in the dark and I looked in. The girls, oh God. The girls looked so lovely in their long dresses. The boys were in their tuxes looking great. Each of them holding a girl in his arms. They all danced so beautifully. I was there. <laughs> I was there in my ragged shirt. Pimples, boils, and scars all over my face. I was like a jungle animal drawn to the light and looking in. As I watched them dance so beautifully, I kept telling myself, someday, someday my dance will begin. When that day comes, I'll have something that they don't have. I hated them. I hated their beauty. I hated their temporary luck and their untroubled youth. I screamed inside of myself and I said, someday, someday I'll be as happy as any of you. You'll see, you'll see. The band was playing Deep Purple. The janitor had discovered my hiding spot on one of his rounds outside the gym. He thought that I was a beep freak, and he escorted me off campus. I walked off and I kept walking. It was a nice, warm summer night, almost hot. I thought I saw some fireflies. <laughs> but I really wasn't sure. house where I was born and the little window where the sun came peering in at morn. Those were the first verses I memorized in school. They told me the author's name was Anonymous 
and I believed them. I tell you what I remember though. I remember how my father used to come home each night and talk about his job to my mother. The job talk began as soon as he entered the door, it continued over the dinner table, and it ended in the bedroom where my father would scream, Lights out! It was always 8 p.m. So he could get his rest and his full strength for the job the next day. There was no other subject in our house except the job. Listen, my father would say, Henry? If you stay in my house any longer, I'm going to charge you room and board plus laundry. When you get a job, what you owe us will be subtracted from your salary until you're paid up. You understand? Yes, Dad. My mother had also found a job, so this left the house to me. And every day after breakfast, after my parents had left for their jobs, I took off my clothes and I went back to bed and I masturbated. Well, my father would say when he come home from work, Henry, did you find a job today, boy? No, Dad. Listen, any man who wants work can get work. Maybe so, Dad. I can hardly believe you're my son. You don't have any get up and go. You don't have any ambition. Just how in the hell are you going to make it in this world? Well, it's true. I really didn't have much ambition. But there ought to be a place in this world for people without ambition. <laughs> Just tell me. Just tell me. How in the hell could a man enjoy being woken up at 6.30 a.m. by an alarm clock? Leap out of bed, get dressed, force feed, shit, piss, brush hair and teeth, and fight traffic to get to a place where essentially you made lots of money for somebody else and were asked to be grateful for the opportunity to do so. This is Janeski. Oh, I see. Oh, well, thank you very much, mister. It's really very kind of you to say that. Huh? Oh, I see. Well, I tell you what. The beer you can bring over here as long as you don't come in. Goodbye. <laughs> Another writer. <laughs> Hello. Yeah, this is Janeski. Oh, hello, ma'am. Oh, thank you. <laughs> huh? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm a writer. Only I'm not writing right now. Huh? <laughs> oh, I see. Well, I tell you what. Why don't you just come over here for a beer? We can talk about that. Yeah? <laughs> Good. I'll see you later. Goodbye. How come your number is not unlisted? The men phone and they ask me that. Are you really Mr. Henry Chinaski, the writer? Yes, I tell them. I like your stuff, they say. You mind if I come over and bring a couple of six packs? The beer you can bring over, I say, as long as you don't come in. But when the women phone, I say, oh, yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I'm a writer, only I'm not writing right now. I feel foolish phoning you, Mr. Chinaski. They say, I was surprised to find you listed in the phone book. I have my reasons, I tell them. 
<laughs> By the way, why don't you just come over for a beer? Oh, you wouldn't mind, Mr. Chinesky, you wouldn't mind. And they arrive at my door, handsome women, women of good mind and body and eye. Now often, there isn't much sex, but I'm used to that. Yet it's good, I mean, it's so good just to look at them. And some rare times, I do have unexpected good luck. Otherwise, for a man of 55 who didn't get laid until he was 23, and not very often until he was 50, <laughs> I think I should stay listed via the phone book until I get as much as the average man has had. <laughs> of course, I'll have to keep writing immortal poems. <laughs> but the inspiration is always there. Women! approaching my door and I'm glad when those heels walk away I'm glad to fuck I'm glad to care and I'm glad when it's over and since it's always either starting or finishing I am glad most of the time Holy. But love isn't just sex. Most females I know are so ambitious. Me, I just like to lie around on large, comfortable pillows at three o'clock in the afternoon. My belly to the ceiling after making love. It's so easy to be easy. If you let it, it's all that is necessary. But the female is so strange, so very ambitious. Shit, man, they say. I can't sleep away the day, Henry. I can't sleep away the day. All we do is eat, sleep, make love. All we do is eat, sleep, make love. I just don't know. I don't know why some women think effort and energy has anything to do with living. <laughs> women. Women are always in a hurry these days. They're always in a hurry. I tried it standing up this time. She was in a hurry. <laughs> it doesn't usually work. But this time, it seemed to. She kept saying, Oh my God, Henry. Oh my God, you've got beautiful, strong legs. 
Well, that was all right until she lifted her feet off the floor and she wrapped her legs around my middle. <laughs> oh my God, Henry, oh my God, you got beautiful legs. She weighed 165 pounds. <laughs> she hung there around my waist as I worked. It was when I climaxed that I felt the pain fly straight up my spine. I dropped her on the couch. I walked about the room, but the pain remained. Look, I told her, sweetheart, you better leave. I gotta develop some film in my dark room. She got up, she got dressed, and she left. And I walked over to my kitchen to get me a glass of water. I got a glass full in my left hand and the pain. The pain extended to my neck and my arms. I dropped the glass of water which broke all over the floor. I got into a tub full of hot water and Epsom salts and just as I got stretched out, the phone rang. As I tried to straighten my back, the pain, the pain extended to my neck and my arms. I flopped about. I grabbed the sides of the tub and I got out with shots of green, yellow and red light flashing in my brain. The phone kept ringing. I pick it up. Hello. I said. I love you. She said. Oh, oh, thanks. <laughs> thanks, I said. Is that all you've got to say, Henry? She said. Yes, yes, I said. Well, eat shit, she said. <laughs> and hung up on me. I thought as I walked back to the bathroom, love dries up even faster than sperm does. <laughs> poems, poems, poems. New poems, old poems, poems to trade. This next poem is not for sale. This poem is a gift. It is a gift for all who are fortunate enough to be in love tonight. I once knew a woman who kept buying puzzles. Chinese puzzles, blocks, wires, pieces that kind of fit together into some kind of order. She works it out mathematically. She solves all her puzzles. She lives down by the sea. She puts sugar out for the ants. And she believes ultimately in a better world. Her hair is white. She seldom combs it. Her teeth are snagged. And she wears loose, shapeless coveralls over a body that most women would wish they had. For many years, she irritated me with what I considered her eccentricities, like soaking eggshells in water to feed the plants so that they'd get calcium. But finally, when I think of her life and compare it to other lives more dazzling, original, and beautiful, I realize that she has hurt fewer people than anybody I know. And by hurt, I simply mean hurt. She'd had some terrible times, times when maybe I should have helped her more, for she is the mother of my only child, and we were once great lovers. 
But like I said, she has come through. She's hurt fewer people than anybody I know. And if you look at it like that, well, she has created a better world. She has won. Francis, Francis, wherever you are, this poem is for you. Thank <laughs> you.